Trust me when I tell you, when you meet these two guys, you're going to be obsessed with them as well. Please join me in welcoming Michael and Danny Filippo, the directors of Talk To Me. How are you guys doing? Good. Hello, everyone. A few extra seats here. Uh. Oh. <laughs> Intimate conversations are nice. And then it is on all these people in this room to go and spread the word about talk to me and you guys when we're done. But like, I got to have this line of questioning, earn that enthusiasm. And I'm going to take my job very seriously right now. It's nice to have so much time with you guys because we get to go back to the very, very beginning. And I love starting here. What was the movie you saw or personal experience you had that first made you both say, we absolutely have to be filmmakers and storytellers? It was the Goosebump novels. Back in the day, I was obsessed with those things. I never read them. I just looked at the covers. Uh, but I, <laughs> I used to be so obsessed with the Goosebump covers. And I'm like, one day I'm going to be R.L. Stein. And um, yes, I didn't realize he wasn't the director of the also movies. Remember they used to do the movies on? Yeah. Those we used to be obsessed with as well. I, I think we've just always been drawn to filmmaking just uh, like instinctually. Like uh, our dad had a camera and we had like, 12 kids around the same age and we just took dad's camera and we'd always just be making stuff so i don't know yeah i i don't know if it was goosebumps for me but it was <laughs> it was just something that we always just did you know um and we made movies we did two things we did, made movies together and beat the shit out of each other with backyard wrestling those are the two yes i've watched some of that uh i highly recommend say cheese and die if you ever do wind up reading a goosebumps book i love that one as a kid Here's a question I'm excited to ask you guys, because I was reading that the types of movies you like watching are very different from the content you wound up making. So when you first said to yourselves, like, the career goal is to be a filmmaker, what did you picture making it as? Was there a particular filmmaker that you wanted to follow in the footsteps of, a genre you wanted to be in? What did it look like initially? I, I guess we want the um, always wanted the freedom to explore multiple genres because we're excited about multiple genres. I'm obviously so in love with horror, and it was like the first things we watched in the cinema. We had like um, our dad's friend. She would used to sneak us into all the movies we shouldn't be allowed to watch. Uh, so like one of my first cinema-going experiences was Freddy vs. Jason and then Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the remake. Uh, so like, our, our, yeah, she used to sneak us into all those. Michael left the Texas Chainsaw Massacre screening because he was a coward. What scene? What scene got you? It's when she gets thrown down the stairs and her friend's on the meat hook. And then I was like, to the lady that took us, I was like, I think I've got to go. I feel a bit sick. And then she's like, you'll be fine. And then the girl starts stabbing her friend. He's like, oh! And then Leatherface came downstairs. So I was like, oh, yeah, I have to leave. And I just ran out. Yeah, my That's fair enough, fair enough. I think we all have those, like, that one scarring film experience as a child. Is that yours or is there something else that was, worse than that? That was one of them. Oh. I swear I heard a chainsaw in my room. Like, no, you didn't. Yeah, Dad did that on purpose to scare you. No. <laughs> good, good luck with Evil Dead Rise this week. So given that reaction to Texas Chainsaw, of all the horror movies you guys saw when you were too young to be watching them, which would you say like shaped the types of things you wanted to bring to screen as horror filmmakers? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it probably would be The Exorcist, uh, which was like, yes, like, in, like you know, there's, it's, it's the, the head of the possession genre. So like, uh, and um, Talk To Me is a possession film. So, you know, it was like, yeah, that was the ultimate, like, holy shit movie to watch as a kid. It was like, yeah, so nuts, so scarring, so beautiful. This is a good one. Um, so you guys decide you want to get into film. At the time, what did you think that you had to do to like start down the path of becoming a filmmaker and now having done it, would you recommend those first steps to somebody else out there who wants to be one? Well, I, I, um, I could never hold down a normal job. So I used to do, um, like, as I turned 18, I did medical trials to, like, uh, like fund my stuff. So I would check into a hospital for two months at a time. There was a drug that wasn't on the market yet. And they didn't know what the side effects were. So they'd get, like, young males to just, like, do... We don't recommend that part. Yeah, no, don't, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Sounds like a great horror movie idea. Maybe <laughs> yeah, that should be yeah. your next film. It was very... You got a lot of writing done in there. Yeah, I went and visited Danny once, and he was like... <laughs> and I'm like, are you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's just a side effect of the, of the drug. <laughs> And yeah, like, yeah I, I think that it was just me like I think the path that we would recommend that we took is just be making stuff, always be making stuff. 
and we made so much stuff before we went into the YouTube world. Like we made a TV show with our friends. Not a TV show, it wasn't on TV. Okay. <laughs> well, it was on my TV, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and we did like 87 episodes, 10 seasons of it. We made six movies and no one ever saw it. It was just us. Like We used to make it for our friend's older sister, Nelly, and she was like, we'd have movie nights of her and we'd just have, yeah, Tamafi fans. We'd show our shitty things. She goes, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's so incredibly important to have that commitment early on because you can't do it now, even with the resources behind you, unless you're able to kind of like keep your minds focused and power through that. I love it. Yeah, yeah. And then it was always, yeah, we were just constantly making stuff. Like when we, like that was like, between 13 and 18 we'd done that stuff and then before that between 9 and 12 where these movies called the evil flamingo which was like our ripoff of chucky and we had like a flamingo doll that would go around and pull out our friends eyeballs with really terrible special effects <laughs> yeah and we had a black and white like we'd turn the camera black and white and then we'd like fill it with water and pretend it was blood like yeah sorry, yeah or tomato sauce was really effective tomato well. sauce and yep. yeah that and, and also like when we're trying to get into the film industry like uh I would volunteer for films and just work for free on like, oh, I'll do whatever whatever you guys want, production assisting, production running. And there was a producer that I would, I would always do the movies for, Julie Byrne, her name was. And she's like, you can't keep doing these productions for free, Michael. I was like, I, want, I just want to be involved with, you know, like the first time I saw like a grip truck and then like a lighting and then like, the, the, and then the cameras and stuff. I was like, oh my God, it's like, it's an actual job that people do. I just want to be surrounded by that world. And she said to me, she's like, okay, next job, I'll get you paid. So I did like four or five films for free, like these big shoots. And then um, that next film was The Bubble Dook. So she got, uh, yeah, I got to drive. I was, I was like eight, 19 and I got to drive. Well, Essie Davis didn't like that at first, the Ellie, because <laughs> I was just a kid, you know. But um, yeah, I was able to drive full time on, uh, yeah, the Bubble Duke. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I was on the Bubble Duke. I did like, uh, I did work experience initially, and then they eventually said, "Do you want a job? I mean, you can be credited, but you still have to do it for free." I was like, "I'm so down." And then when the film came out and they gave me my credit, it said work experience, Danny Filippo, which I wanted like a lighting assistant or something. But uh, yeah, and then I, I used to go, like, I used to go with Michael to sex. I didn't have my license yet. And so Michael would drive me to set and then the producers were like to Michael, you can't take your brother to set while you're driving the actor and the director around. And then it's like, that's really unprofessional. And then so they said that I couldn't go with him anymore. But if I didn't go with Michael, I couldn't get there and I really wanted to be there. So I used to hide in the back seat and then he used to put clothes over me. I used to pretend I wasn't in yeah. there. I put him in the boot. I, I, yeah, and put clothes on him. Once Essie so I'm going to put my bag in the back. I'm like, don't. <laughs> I'm like, it's all right. And then I, yeah, she eventually I, discovered him. And then, yeah, and then she, like, uh, I, Michael texted me when um, I was in the back seat. He texted me. He's like, Essie's coming now. Keep your head down or I'll fucking slaughter you. Is what he texted me. And then he accidentally sent it to the producer. <laughs> I have so many follow-up <laughs> questions. I, I think the first is, since then, have you reconnected with Essie Davis and Jennifer Kent? And have they like seen where you've gone since the Babadook? We actually reached out to Essie to be in uh, Talk To Me. And we got a rejection. But that was very nice. So we're like, we're like it's a, you know, we used to drive you I, around. I think that like working on that set was the first time that I saw true passion from a director. So Jen was, uh, she obsessed about like every shot and every frame and things like that. I could, I could tell that she wasn't there for a paycheck. She wanted to make this the best it could be. So, um, and she was like intense on set, but I like, I loved it. I just wanted to help her every step of the way. And I was inspired by her. And I'm like, I was like, there's no way this movie will turn out bad because she cares so much about everything. Whereas some of the stuff I worked on beforehand, it seemed like it was like, it was like, eh, whatever, you know, whereas she really, really cared and she, she, she would make sure she got what she wanted, you know. And um, yeah, I really, really admire that. Um, I, I do admire that about Jen. Yeah, she's yeah. an artist. She's yeah. awesome. She was the first artist that we got to be on set with, which was so amazing. And no, we don't reach out because I'm nervous too. I don't know, hey, you know, how's this? Just, yeah. yeah. I feel like she would appreciate it, especially when you could show her talk to me now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we could show say, her. Yeah. Say it's an early influence. Um, going back to something else you brought up, because. I, I love the idea. I know everybody in this industry has a particular specialty, but I love when filmmakers take the time to learn about every single different job on a set because I feel like it's the type of thing where if you understand everybody else's job, you, it's like an all boats rise type thing. So is there any particular element of filmmaking that you were glad to have learned on those early sets that you would encourage more aspiring filmmakers to learn about even if they want to, let's say, be a director? Yeah, so it was even after that. So when we're doing our YouTube stuff, we've got a YouTube channel called Raka Raka. Like we used to run all of that by ourselves. So I would write it and shoot it. Mark would be in front of it. 
jumping in front of cars or whatever he's doing. And then like I, I would do like uh, VFX and color grade and then Michael would do sound effects and music. So we're on top of all of those parts as well. And then as the videos got bigger, we we're able to like hire different VFX artists and like be on top of that stuff. So that really helped us with the post of Talk To Me. It was a bit probably a bit annoying for the editor because I did an edit of the movie, Michael did an edit of the movie and the editor did an edit of the movie. And so we had to like put all three edits together. So it was like- I just use mainly mine, but- yeah. No, well, uh, <laughs> we had, it was good to, uh, yeah, like I, I guess we'd encourage to do as much as you can yourself, uh, especially when you're starting out so you don't have to rely on other people. Because when we did things like we were waiting for people to do things and they just like, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll eventually, but it's like, if you just learn to do it yourself, and you can, it's so easy now, like through YouTube and stuff, you can see the tutorials to do stuff and it's made so easy to, to edit and things like that. It's like, if you can learn to do that stuff yourself, I think you give yourself like, um, yeah, a, a step forward. And I think it helped us on the set, you know, when we have to, you know, make up like things on the, on the, on the fly and things like that. Like when you're in the middle of production, it like, really helps have that experience. The, the flip side of that is I think it's good to know a little bit about every single job, but then you also need to be able to relinquish control when oh, necessary. Yeah, yeah. What was it like for the two of you when you're used to doing just about everything yourself, finding out the times on Talk To Me to say like, you are the expert in this department, we hand the reins over to you. Oh, it was all about finding the right heads of department. And so it was so incredible to start collaborating with people that were like better than we were at everything. So it was like uh, working with our production designer or our cinematographer or Sophie, the actor. It's like uh, trusting like people that are like artists in their field. And like, it was just like, yeah, so amazing. And and everything was so much better than we could have done by ourselves. So it's like, it was like almost relieving. Yeah. It's like you're like, even with like say performances, we'd used to like get our friends or parents or you know family members and like to be on camera like I don't want to do this like please I mean like try and squeeze a performance out of them and use any kind of thing we can when you have like talented you know artists like Sophie where it's like man like you you can just like give her like one little note and like she will uh, and she can she registers it and does it even in the most subtle way and like it, it's just like so amazing to see that in front of you it's like you're looking at it on the monitor it's like oh it looks better than we can ever imagine because we've got people like Aaron with camera and then like the performances are, are better than we imagined as well it's like yeah like see getting those people together the right people yeah. oh I have many questions about your cast they are how many people here have seen talk to me at the festival. I like that. For everybody who hasn't, look up more information about when it's screening at South By. And also tell you right now, there's a buzz screening tonight at AFS Cinema. It's Austin, uh, Austin Film Society at 8 o'clock. So you could see it then. Before I get into my talk to me specific questions, I did have one about making the transition from YouTube to filmmaking. And I'll fully admit this is a very poorly worded question, but just to clearly convey the idea, what was it like trying to convince the necessary powers in the film industry that you weren't just YouTubers and that you could be serious filmmakers too? Yeah, it was, I think it, it was like a, a bit of a whisper joke on set that like these guys don't know what they're doing. Like I remember hearing that earlier on from like some people that were on the career department. It's a, it's a, there is a stigma attached to it, the like the YouTube thing. But I think our content, the stuff that we made was always... It's like cinematically driven. Like it oh, was. You tell yourself that. Yeah. Well, we thought it did <laughs> was anyway. <laughs> but we had worked with so many people that worked in the film industry. Um, but I guess convincing it was a question. It's like, yeah, you can do a few minutes on on a video, but can you do like a ninety minutes a story with characters and like a, a good script and direct like long form piece of your know, narrative? It, it it was like the 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 first step of that was uh, yeah finding the producers, which uh, Samantha Jennings from Causeway Films was like our guiding star and it was like she was like our ambassador and so she was able to approach finances and stuff like that and so I trust them as filmmakers and so she was yeah she was amazing at that yeah it was a risky process the whole thing right and we rolled the dice so many times with us and Causeway like they put their reputations on the line to make it with us and like uh and it was you know when we we were going to do it with the studio but then we decided to go independent because we wanted to keep our creative vision we didn't want to hand over creative control you know you hear those stories on set of like people that direct something and then the studio's like oh, we're going to re-edit that like uh, we just wouldn't react well to that so with Sam like we came up with the decisions all right let's do it independently let's let's uh we reinvested our fees that you know to get the cast and stuff we wanted and so did Causeway like we all just like risked it together and um it just came out really really well so we're so so thankful to to Causeway yeah, and Sam, and yeah it was like yeah that that initial like the initial 
uh, we got approached by a studio and then they started giving us these notes for like a later draft and it was like got to turn the movie into something else completely. And uh, yeah, I, like it just, like I don't know how you could possibly direct something you don't understand in terms of like notes, or, like doing a draft where I'm like incorporating someone else's vision. And then, yeah, I already struggled to talk to the actors. Right, Sophie? Is she in here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So many, so many questions right now. I want to go back to the YouTube videos really quick. Is there an example of something that, you know, might be deemed like a crazy, fun, silly thing that happened in a YouTube video that everyone can look up but know that wound up being a really valuable filmmaking experience for you that let you do something on your first feature that you wouldn't have been able to had you not made that short? Um, I think, like, every video that we did, we try and incorporate a new idea or concept like say we'd wanted to do we want to do a fight scene with a sinking set right so we like how do we pull that off and we'd work with our stunt team and and um yeah like the set the the set creators to create this thing like where we have it on a crane to like sink in the water while we're fighting in there and like coming up with new rigs like there's a video we did for the naruto game it's a naruto is an anime uh an anime and a manga a manga but we did a video for it for our channel, and we came up we we came up with rigs that had never been done before. Um, like say I was like, so we had a gigantic crane. I was on top like on the crane going down, like kicking another guy that's in a different harness. And then we had another line where Danny was attached to filming it, so we we're all going down at the same time. Like creating rigs like that, um, I think it helped us with uh, uh, coming up with new, unique ways to shoot things on set, you know, and we're excited to do future films because there's other genres we want to tackle and uh, horror we love, but we want to do the other stuff as well. And I think we're excited to, to yeah, bring that. I never like boxing filmmakers into one genre, but like stay in horror as much as you guys want. And also we like to will in ex into existence more talk to me. Oh, yes, yes. We do have an idea for talk to me too, which is so awesome. And talk to me seven in space. Yes, that's, that. it. that's happening I'll too. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you got to have talk to me six set in New York City too. That's a thing that's happening now. Um, Going going back to what you guys were bringing up about making this movie independently instead of with a studio. Going back to like the very beginning of that, when you're coming from you know the YouTube realm and also having worked uh, as like PAs and runners and drivers on previous films, what would you say was the key to like taking this idea you had and actually getting it in front of the right eyes at a studio to even have it considered to begin with? Well, yeah, the the biggest thing uh, is the script. Like having a script is the first step to anything. Uh, like, uh, like we couldn't approach Causeway without a script. We can't approach any finance without a script. So well, you can, like, with a concept, if they. they I mean, if you're an established filmmaker, but I think if you're like well, definitely not. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So we weren't established filmmakers, <laughs> so like we had to have like something to show that like we were, you know. Uh, and I think it was like Danny would. Uh, he sent the script out to people like the at these com like these studios. They're like this isn't how you do it. Do you have like representation and things yeah, like that? Yeah. So it was like getting a film manager. I, I sent it to the head of Fox and they're like, this is not how you approach. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm surprised they responded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was very nice. He very nicely said, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like that was before I had the producer attached. I did it because I was just like trying anything I could to have people see it. Um, I would like tweet Jason Blum. I'm like, hey, I've got a script for you to read. And then I got blocked. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> like, blocked anymore. <laughs> The, uh, so, sorry, j just backpedaling a little bit, when it was like taking the leap into film, um, there was Screen Australia uh, helped us a lot with developing into longer form. Like they gave us funding to work with crews and stuff with a budget. Um, a few times they helped us take those next steps. Like they gave us funding once to do, we didn't want to do like a long, a really long form video, just like a video, but they wanted us to do like a longer s storytelling thing. So they funded a, uh, a fake live stream we did. We shot it, it took a month to make and we shot it over a week, but we edited it to look like one shot. So it looked like a live stream on a camera and then we we made it, edited it, everything, and then we released it on the channel as a live stream, like we live streamed a video. So everyone watching it thought it was real and then like we slowly, it started off like with a stunt, oh, look at this stunt, and then it goes wrong and we slowly, slowly changed things more and more unrealistic. Like there's a there's a car chase, we get hit by a car and we're rolling down this thing and the comments go, and you see the comments go, 
go crazy. And we slowly, slowly made it more and more unbelievable where in the end there was like a gigantic monster eating people and stuff. And the, the fans like, oh, fuck, this is fake. <laughs> Should have known from the beginning. You guys should make a screen life movie. Have you ever considered that? A screen <laughs> life movie? Yeah, like, like a movie that takes place entirely on someone's screen, like as though you were watching someone's live oh, stream or, you know, you, like searching, you. missing, those types of films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that was our screen life thing. I think it was like, four, it was like 45 minutes live stream. Um, but that was like Screen Australia, like helping us develop into longer. So we are very. I, I really liked the hosts, which was cool. That was like a screen life. Thing. That was cool really awesome. Movie. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe that, and it's and like Cloverfield. Need to do those. Cloverfield. Yeah. Is that screen life? Would you say it's Cloverfield? Found, found footage. footage. Found footage. Found footage. Found found footage. footage. Still 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 kind of counts. Still kind of counts. Yeah, it's the vibe. Um, going going back to the studio versus independent thing, just so we can have an example to kind of like picture and fully understand that. Can you give us an example of maybe something a studio would have given you on this production that would have tempted you to commit to working with them? But then on the other hand, what is something that they wouldn't have let you do if you had committed to a studio versus making it independent? Yeah. Well, yeah. That, like um. A bigger budget, obviously, uh, and them saying, "Oh, we've got these connections with these distributions or these cinemas, so we can make sure that your film's out in cinemas." If you do it independently, you take the gamble of not being able to sell it to distributors, or like, or like distributors not picking it up. So they said that, and then like an example of like their notes were stuff like, "Oh, we really want to investigate this. The film's about like this hand that you can use to speak to the dead." Uh, and they said that we want there to be this big investigation after the midpoint and you find out the mythology and the history. And I was like, oh, man, it's like, oh, yeah, the, the boringest part of the film to me is watching them look at research the demon behind it. In the library. Yeah, yeah, they're in the library or on Google. Google haunted hand. Oh, look at this. Like, it, it's like um really boring. And then the notes are so boring. And I was like, oh, man, I'd be so bored on set directing that. And, and um, But you put it in the sequel. Huh? <laughs> The key is the movie winds up making you wonder about all that backstory information, but yeah. you don't hand it to us, so it keeps the movie on our minds a lot. Longer. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's yeah. there's definitely lots of hints and stuff we do to the, to the lore of things, like where there is a massive, like we know everything about it, but it's like choosing the bits, you know, that that kind of you can if you watch the film. I think you don't like on a second or third viewing. There's things that we plant in there that are you know around you know the things said and shown. That's all I'll say. I might have picked up on a few a few new things that I didn't catch the first time oh. around. I like that. I like that. Um, originally, this idea was a short, right? What would you say is the biggest difference between the short story and the feature story? And, and maybe did you have a break story moment, uh, an idea you came up with that solidified to you guys that, like, yes, we're not just extending this short, but we're justifying the fact that it's now going to be a feature-length film? Yeah, yeah, because I already had the idea of um, doing something like this because I, I told this experience at, like, one of the Q&As. But, like, yeah, these neighbour kids that we grew up with and, like, we were, like, babysitting and stuff like that. Uh, there was three boys, and then one of them was experimenting with drugs, was having a negative reaction to the drug, uh, and his friends that were with him were, like, filming him and laughing at him. And then, like, that, that clip circulated on Snapchat. I remember seeing that, and it's scaring the shit out of me. Like, I found it, like, a really, yeah, a difficult thing to watch. So I just remember... That was always like I planted uh, like a seed in my head for this sort of film. And then uh, a friend of ours, Daley Pearson, who works on this cartoon called Bluey, had like um, a short film for like a, a horror comedy thing about... He's Pearson. also Thor's Bluey roommate. got the biggest reaction yeah. from this audience. <laughs> hey, Bluey's great. Films. He's yeah. also Thor's roommate in the online... Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. very... Yeah, he's awesome. Like, um, yeah, he had a, a short film that he wrote, an idea of like kids... Uh, what are they using? Possession, like possessing Yeah, themselves. but it was like, like, it was like a, a comedy, over-the-top comedy thing. Uh, so he'd sent that, and then he said, can you do a pass of this? Do you want to make this? And I read it, and I was like, oh, I like, actually have an idea for this. And there was another film I was working on called Blue World, which was a bit more of a drama, which had all, like, the character relationships that were in Talk To Me. So I just started, like, implementing them into the short, and I changed the short to be more horror than a comedy. And then once I started writing, it was, like, six pages initially. I just couldn't stop. And, like, within ten, uh, two weeks, I had 80 pages, which had, like, the, uh, the big set-piece moments of Talk To Me. Uh, and then I, ha I have a co-writer that I work with that's really good at the, all the structure stuff and like expanding things creatively. So we used to just, we just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until we had like a draft that we were comfortable enough to show you to Causeway. Okay, so there was something that I picked up in the production notes that I wanted to ask you guys about. I had read that there there was an earlier, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, you guys have already cursed, but I'm going to play it safe, a very effed up version of the script. Mm. What is the biggest difference between the very effed up version and what we see in the final film? Oh my gosh. I, I, yeah, well... <laughs> It was, it was like everything just went too far and like the first possession was so extreme 
that it was like, why would the kids do this again? So it was about like peeling, <laughs> peeling it back because that was like, man, it's embarrassing. Well, I think it's like instinctually, like with our YouTube stuff, we went like all the way with things like with like violent stuff, like because we work with these ma amazing makeup artists, Beck Barato and um and uh, Beck Troisi, these girls that we Corey and Marie love work, yeah, working with, and like we'd always like go oh what's the most extreme thing we could do like we do crazy crazy blood rigs and effects and things like that i think like when you're writing especially like the initial drafts you'd go all the way and then it's like peeling it back enough because you don't want it to be like just gratuitous and like yeah. just like just body shock horror for the sake of it we wanted those moments to be earned and not like uh linger on them for the sake of lingering on them so yeah we were it was like finding the nice medium between because this is a horror film and you want to have those horrific moments but then also like at the same time we wanted to have that strong dramatic core so we want it was like finding the balance between those two yeah and trusting that um the characters would be strong enough to carry the drama and you don't have to just keep relying on these over the top because it was so yeah like the initial draft was so extreme you guys are difficult. My head is like exploding with follow-up questions. I'm just going to take this moment to like briefly remind everyone that you could go on the app and submit questions that we could bring up right now if you want to do that. We'll also take live questions from the audience towards the end of the Q&A. So start st thinking of them now. Okay, going back to the like 500 things I just thought of when you were talking about that. So I love emphasizing the value of how things can change as you're making, because like a lot of people think, you know, you come in with a really great script and you execute your plan and you should have everything planned to a T. Sometimes when you change things on the spot, it could evolve and make things even better than they would have been if you had stuck to the script. So what would you say change the most from script to screen during the making of Talk I, I think um, the possessions and what the demons were doing was what we changed mostly. Yeah. Like from script to screen, like while you're shooting? Is that what you're saying while you're shooting? Yeah, mainly on set with, with like your team too, like your department heads, your cast, oh, all that. Yeah, I, I think that like you have to kind of uh, – there's – there's changes that are going to be made all the time, like how you picture it. And then like, you know, with like budgetary restrictions and stuff, like we shot also in the middle of COVID, like not in the middle of COVID, it was towards the end of COVID, but it was like spiking up again. So when we went on set, we didn't know whether we'd be there tomorrow, the production could shut down. And it was one week where we lost like eight people. And it was on Friday. We're like, damn, it's like Survivor out here. And we're, and we're like, wait till Monday. We're going to be all gone. But it was like, we had to, you know, make changes and adapt to the things that were happening. Um, that yeah i think like that kind of stuff and, it, and it, sometimes it makes it better as well like when you have you're on a strict time and like for example there's like there was a transformation scene that we were gonna yeah well, like mia initially like um she goes to our there's a scene where she confronts whoa, 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 oh, hey, whoa, hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> i'm waiting to see where you guys draw the line with this yeah no uh, I, 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 I think, think like, we're gonna have a transformation scene. like we wanted to do yes yeah, so we wanted to show a character turning into someone else and it was going to be like a... Practically, yeah. Yeah, practically see their fingers extend, their like hair fall out, and we had like a, a big thing. And then like as we were progressing and things are falling behind, they're like, we did not have the time or budget for this. But you know what was... We actually... I think we had a little bit, bit of a cheat code because our minds were like, we'll just pick this up after. We had this thing we created called the ghost unit. We're going to do pickup shots without anyone knowing. Yeah, as so like we'll, we'll t We told Aaron, the cinematographer, we'll like, grab the camera, we'll go, we'll shoot this in a different day. But then once we did shoot the alternative version where there was no transformation, it was stronger. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, we don't need it. Like the ghost unit was disbanded. <laughs> Your possession material in this movie is is exceptional. What would you say is maybe a possession filmmaking do and don't that you've picked up on over the years of, you know, watching other paranormal possession supernatural films? Yeah, well, no, it was always about trusting the actors. And then, like, yeah, in, in the pre-production, we got all the actors to do each other's possessions because in some possessions, some, one of the possessions, there's, like, embarrassing stuff happening in them. But, like, so if everyone does it, like, no one has to be embarrassed. That's that question that just pulled up there. How do you encourage comfort in your cast and crew on days when you're dealing with mm -hmm. uncomfortable mm -hmm. scenes? It's exactly that. It, yeah. it was – so with some of the possessions, there was embarrassing – possessions like for some people and, and tough ones it was getting everyone to do it so every actor did that possession and then also we did that possession the producer did that possession we got the cinematographer to do the possession the first yeah. ad <laughs> like they everyone did it and i think it helped the actors also like oh that, i could use that little thing and also not be as embarrassed on sets because everyone's done it you know yeah 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 and it's yeah. like you're like you're naked everyone's naked today on set yeah but we didn't do naked that's a great behind the scenes featurette <laughs> idea though just like oh yeah we filmed it together. yeah we filmed that's it yeah. 
nice. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah, but like, it's that embarrassing that the producer's like, I don't know if I want my position on there because <laughs> it was I like, yeah, would put it on. Yeah, she'll put it on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Speaking of your performances now, um, I have to ask you about working with the entire cast, but we have to start with Sophie right now. First, I was I was watching the video you guys had made after Sundance, and you were both emphasizing the fact that, like, you know, now that this movie's an A24 movie, like, she's going to break out and she's going to be huge. And I fully believe in that as well. For every other director that is bound to work with her as her career explodes in the future, what quality of her as a collaborator and an actor are you most looking forward to other people getting to experience? Oh, oh just, like, she embodies the character so much and is constantly thinking about it and, and like, the work ethic and... and she was so committed to the uh, the role. Like there was a scene where she's like punishing herself and she was doing it for real, like on set. Like, yeah, like she was just so committed every single step of the way. There were days where we're like, oh, can you not sleep tonight and come to set tomorrow? Not having slept. And she was down to do that, those sort of things. And she was just, uh, yeah, so collaborative, so so committed. It was, yeah. And, and then even if the, you have direction that you can't articulate, like you could just say like a couple of words, like, oh, it's my, and she's like, I get it. And, like she just knew. Yeah, and yeah. she could change the performances. Like we're, we're just so lucky. Like um, when I think of our next film, it's like, fuck, man, I wish we could get someone as talented as Sophie because there's no bad take and it never felt like, Sometimes when there's really good acting, it's like, oh, it's really good acting and it still feels like acting. Like, it never felt like that with her. Like, every single shot, like, you just never had to worry about, like, her performance and things like that. You could always use every frame of her. Yeah, and then even, like, an example of, like, her understanding, like, the way, the things that we were trying to communicate, it was like, I saw her in the hotel hallway yesterday and she had, like, a bag that was, like, blue and fluffy. And I'm like, oh, that's like that Mr. Hat thing looks. She's like, what? She's, she's like, you mean Dr. Zeus? I'm like, yeah. And actually just knew that I meant Dr. Zeus. <laughs> that's an example she of like... Read, she reads you? She reads me. Dr. Zeus, yeah. I don't Dr. know what Dr. Zeus is. Should I know what Dr. Zeus is? Do you know Dr. Zeus? Green eggs and ham? Oh, oh Dr. Sam Zeus. I am? Oh, damn it. Oh, my God. I Dr. Zeus. Dr. Oh, no, Zeus, I thought, Zeus, I thought, the I thought maybe, it was like a, maybe it was like a bluey thing that I wasn't aware <laughs> of or Hercules. something. Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Dr. Seuss. The Greek mythology of Dr. Seuss. Look, it's been a long day. I'm tired. Um, going back to <laughs> what you were saying about how <laughs> Sophie, yeah, that, where the rest of the conversation will be about that, about how she interprets notes. Is there a specific example you can give us about, you know, like a time on set when either the way she interpreted the material or a note you gave completely changed something for the better? Oh, it, like there, there was, there was a, a part where she's getting like, uh, just even like choked or grabbed by her neck in the film. And she was like, purposefully making herself lose breath and she was so committed like her veins were coming out of her head and she was just on the floor and then she had to get up and like walk out and like calm down because she was that committed and like believed the moment that much it was like this big adrenaline dump like that, that's just an example like, she's just well it's just like that thing like also like she can just play every single emotion comedy drama like subtle then like angry and she can be terrifying and scary you know she just does everything and, and emotional like like this is just, yeah. uh, it's, un it's unreal. She's going to be humongous. We know it for yes. a fact. Yes, I, I will very much agree with you on that. Opening it up to the entire cast now, of all the characters in this movie, which one would you say was the easiest to cast? Where like the right person magically presented themselves, but then on the other hand, who was the most difficult to find the right actor for? The hey. hardest the hardest one, oh yeah, um, Zoe, who plays Haley. Uh, they were amazing. Like their audition came in, it was like, whoa! It's such a commanding presence. Like that's yeah. as soon as you saw it, it's like, oh, they're it. Like it's you watch the the um, audition, and it's like, and, and we and that was most of the cast. Like as soon as we see them, it's like, oh, that's that that's that's perfect. That's what we're looking for. And Zoe was one. Like as soon as we saw it, it was like, boom. That boom. was the first, yeah, uh, the role that we cast, and then the rest of them. Like they, they, we found them eventually, but it, it took, it, it was like a longer process. The longest process was Joe, who plays Riley in the film. Like we cast, uh, we like auditioned so many actors, uh, young performers, and I guess the talent pool may not be that big, maybe in Australia or something, but it was very hard to find someone that was, um, we found a lot of kid actors that were really good at like the drama stuff, but when it came to the possession stuff, they just were like, there was a wall that was up and they couldn't properly commit. But like Joe was one where I was like, whoa, he just completely blew our minds. You can't cast that role with any other actor other than someone who is willing to take it to an 11 or that is not believable at all. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It's really I, something else. Um, I want to go back to the idea of, you were talking about the rig you had created on one of your shorts. Is there a specific example in this film where there's like a brand new rig or filmmaking technique that you use that you've never used before that people can look out for? 
Uh, I think in the montage, there's like some shots that we came up with, with like how where the camera's positioned. Like it's, yeah, I don't want to spoil too much, but like it's like rigs that are, yeah. Like there was one rig. That moved with the camera, like yeah. with the performer. Kind there, of. there was someone that was on a chair and the chair was rocking side to side. And we built a thing. Well, like, yeah, the, the stunt team helped build this thing where it was like the camera was attached to the chair and the swinging thing. So everything was swinging together at once. And it's on screen for like half a second. But you might see that in the montage, which is like one of those oh, things. Oh, another spoiler. I'm full of them. When Bruce Willis dies, you might be able to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's something that's open enough that you could probably answer it without uh, dipping into spoiler territory. And I love asking this question, particularly when it comes to genre filmmaking. But is there anything that people will see on the screen in your movie that, you know, might make them go, I can't believe that's what it took behind the scenes for it to look like that in the finished film. Yeah, I, I think there's some bits like that that are like really short, but it's like the, yeah. the work that went into getting them. And I think like, I respect that about films as well. When they don't, when they do something really impressive, but don't linger on it, you know, like some of the makeup and stuff we did, like it took hours and hours to, to uh, yeah, so, just some lie. And then they're yeah. on set and then they're on screen. I feel bad for the makeup artist, but <laughs> they're on screen for like sometimes not even a second, you know. But it's like when you have those things, that like the, it, it just adds this layer to it. Like where I, I always respect that about movies when you when you see uh, the t it must have um, taken so long, but they don't linger on. It's just part of it because it's just part of the story in the film. You're not like, oh, look at this thing we did. It's just kind of there in, in part of everything. Thing. Like that's the stuff we like. Yeah. So there's, there's the, I think it's the makeup. Like some of the makeups, uh, uh, you know, the um, prosthetic work took. There was one actor that had to go through it for seven hours to get this thing, and then he had to go on set for like ten hours, and then he had to go and then take it off for a few more hours. So there was like and he was seventy years old, and he was seventy, but he was down. He was he was keen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, it's like the makeup stuff took a very long time, and we we're very specific about makeup, and our makeup artists were just like with us every step of the way, which was so cool. Here's another question that kind of touches on that, but also how exceptional your cast is. One of my favorite qualities of this movie is that it does have like that fun to watch horror vibe, where you're like you're sitting there and you're basically one like, what would I do in that situation? Would I hold the hand too? But also, it's got a really strong emotional backbone. So can you kind of talk a little bit about what it was like balancing that and making sure you were never tipping the scale too far one way or the other. Uh, just was... <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised that's the first time that's happened. Do you want to find about this? You can if you want. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what was the question? No, I remember, I remember. The, um, I think that we always wanted to, we're obsessed with drama films. Like my, fam my favorite TV show is In Treatment which is just uh, a therapist talking to his patients for 20 minutes an episode. Or even like, our, yeah, the films, like you said, like, yeah, the films we like watching are very different to the stuff we made on YouTube. Like we love foreign dramas, like, uh, you know, like the Danish dramas, the Dutch, like the Korean films, like the really small. I went through a phase like watching all the mainstream Hollywood stuff and it, it, it will cost so much money. And then you watch like this, like really like this really tiny independent like foreign film and it's like oh it's so much better stronger characters stronger themes like the the shots like they they carry like a weight about them and the performances and stuff like we love that stuff like and that's what we wanted to make sure with our film we wanted it to be work both as a like i guess a commercial horror film but also not lose that that strong emotional core and that's the movies we love like and that's what we respect so much about um bong joon ho like memories of murder is my favorite film like he merges genres so seamlessly comedy uh scary drama like all in in once and it feels like as a whole of one piece because like in in reality as well you're never just one emotion you're not just scared the whole time you know people would make jokes in bad situations and, and things like that it's like we wanted to bring that and i think we want to do that with all our films it's like yes if it's a genre film it is but also work uh on the other planes as well yeah like I, uh to make sure that you're scared of the film is that you have to be scared for the characters and care about the characters and like uh, writing is always a therapy. So it's always about like finding things that scares me or like is affecting me at the time. And like I can integrate those really personal things that I'm still trying to figure out in my head onto the page. And it's just therapeutic. And, and so like I just want uh, like all our films to be uh, expressive of us, subconscious, like yeah, what's going on with us, like, it, like personally. But then yeah. Is someone typing this live? Like, look at that thing. Is someone I've been that? watching and it's very impressive. TikTok, Tilly, 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 Tilly. <laughs> tilly, 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 tilly. <laughs> Let's see. Did anything happen? <laughs> <laughs> no. Very impressive. 
No, see, they're, they're not doing it. No, no, let's see. No, they're, they're freaking oh, they're, out they're, 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 <laughs> they're not indulging. I'm us sorry. Right now. <laughs> um, You're doing I great. I wanna, I wanna emphasize. No, they're continuing now. We're just making a poor person. It's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Michael will die tomorrow. They're awesome. They're awesome. I'll, I want this in writing. I'm not just saying this because I'm sitting here talking to you guys right now, but that balance of, of heart and emotion, but also fun horror is so exceptionally well done. And it winds up making Talk to Me the type of experience that you enjoy the first time around, but you wind up seeing so many performance subtleties and nuances the second and probably third time around that I think makes this movie a very worth while repeat watch so if anyone's seen it already out south by southwest now you gotta go see it again yeah. i saw a question there about a24 so peter had uh saw that you have a24 as a distributor can you talk about how that happened and i was very curious because sundance had like you know a little bidding war going on there so what was it like having your first experience at a big festival doing that man well even getting accepted into sundance and then berlin film festival as well, and then here it was like a it was like the, it was it was a really tough movie to make, right? And it was and it was risky and like uh, we didn't know what the reception would be. So when Sundance said like they got got in, it was like a big like oh my god! Like yeah. I'd never would have thought that a movie we would make would even get into a festival like that. And then so when we were there and there was like this like this weird hype around it before pe anyone had even seen it. And then we're like oh man, I hope it, I hope it lives up to this hype. Like yeah, people were like yeah. well apparently it's amazing. It's like a fuck you know. And then we went there and that we had that premiere and we're like oh eight twenty four is gonna be there. Ari Aster is gonna be there. You know so all these uh, critics and stuff are gonna be there. That was so scary. But then after uh, we watched, they they watched it, and then A24 reached out to us, and then came, they all came to us right in a room, and then pitched themselves to us. Like this is why we think like we're A24. We're like it's like we we know who you are. We fucking love A24 movies. Yeah, yeah. And like and and have them so passionately like wanting to do the film, and then they left. Right, and then there was I think another offer came because it was like a bidding war, and then they came back with more people. Yeah, <laughs> it was like that spoke to us, and, and it was like it was like. Instead of the other studios, like there was a face to A24 and it felt really personal and the connection was like they were there in the room. Whereas like the other people that were making bids, they were like this invisible force for some of the studios. And then uh, yeah, like, they, it, 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 it came out eventually that uh, even if there was the a bigger offer from the studios, we were still going to pick A24. Because it was like... Uh, it wasn't like another studio or another filmmaker presenting us, A24. It just felt like they really prioritized their filmmakers and pushed their filmmakers and they picked such great films. Like you and, and you could feel they they let they invited us to a um like a screening of the Oscars the other night and you could just feel the love sorry, the, the love and dedication in the room, like the passion. It was so like inspiring to be in there. It's like, oh my God, like that's they're like a family. Like everyone is so nice and awesome and 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 want to help any way they can. It's like a uh, I've never uh felt so like safe like with with a, a yeah, any yeah. kind of that you should have felt the energy in this room. It was, it was amazing. Like, it was so incredible like to be and uh, yeah it was yeah the most inspiring thing. And then they're like yeah you know and any uh, any like for future ideas and stuff like what do you want to do like want to help you guys and it's like so like validating you know and like amazing like we're, it, it feels like it's still everything all this still feels like a dream but our, the reaction was like Sundance would just spend the entire time crying which is in that <laughs> video uh, like us finding out that, yeah, that they had made an offer and stuff it's just like it was very overwhelming that video is utterly delightful uh, yeah <laughs> makes yeah. me very happy so I, I it also makes me very happy hearing how you guys speak about the folks over at A24 because I'm a big fan of theirs and I like hearing that about them and how they operate but what about in terms of what it means to have talk to me part of their film library story wise why did that feel like the best possible fit for you yeah it, it doesn't feel like they're making cookie cutter stuff or they're not looking for anything generic like they're looking for something that works on another level uh, uh, yeah for it to be presented by them it is like incredible and just like a testament to them as a studio like every single speech that was made at the Oscars, they all thanked the studio. And like, how rare is that? But like the so actors cool. to be like, yeah, sh I'm shouting out their studio at the Oscars is like a rare thing. Uh, yeah. It, it, just, it, it means, yeah, like like having that logo at the beginning of the film, it's like <sighs> amazing. You never would have imagined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. impossible. <laughs> Filmmaker first studios make me very happy and proud to be part of this industry. Yeah. All right, let's get to a couple more questions here. We got one from Jake. Can you guys talk about creating content on YouTube that's not YouTube friendly and how you're navigating through it and grew your channel and brand despite it? 
Yeah, I think like when we first started uploading to YouTube, YouTube was like the wild west. You could upload whatever and it was like, you know, and YouTube kind of really embraced us at the beginning because we were making stuff that was different to what was going on the platform. So like they invited us to places and shared our stuff widely and things like that. There was a change in what the platform would allow eventually that, that made it more restrictive to what you could post and, and reach and things like that. So we had to... I have a bend and adapt to that way of like, okay, let's now we have to make stuff kind of like everyone else is making um, or we can focus on the film stuff. So it was kind of like a nice redirect in the terms of like, oh, we can now focus on the film stuff and like not, because it, it is kind of like, yeah, it's, it is tough and like we want to upload to YouTube for the fans. We have such an incredible fan base. We want to upload for them, um, but it is very difficult too, like right now. So it's, but we, we do encourage YouTube. I think they should, they should make changes like to help embrace filmmakers and upcoming artists and things like Cause that. Because even like one of the rules that they changed is like, uh, they would push things that had longer watch times. So like the longer your video is, the more that they'll push that out. So it's like, and, oh, and, and, and consistency. But what about animators that, that come in and take months to put something out that's short but amazing? That's not going to get pushed because it doesn't agree with it. It's like, they need, I think there should be like, and I think YouTube, it's such a, a massive business that's expanding so quickly. It's tough to do that things. But I think that, that they should th uh, take some steps into recognizing like upcoming artists and, and talent and, and, and push them as well. But, like, but yeah, it was it was fine because it did like it pushed us to like do what we always wanted to do, which was film. Yeah, too. and we have no like hate towards YouTube. Like we love YouTube. They, they helped us put, push out and get exposed to begin with and stuff. So we're always thankful to YouTube. Um, yeah, but yeah. I don't know why that conversation is making me think of this, but I also love asking about the test screening or feedback process. What was it like for you to, you know, sharing, uh, talk to me either in the test screening environment or with friends, family, colleagues, you name it, and figuring out when to incorporate a note you were given versus when to stick to your gut and keep something as is? It, our, our test screening wasn't really a proper test screening. It was like 10 family family members and friends so like well, we, we had people from different demographics and like yeah like ages and, and and different types of people that we like just bring in to all watch and give their different opinions i think that if there's a note that you're thinking of you're like oh, and then that comes up like oh see see it's like back up yeah or, or if it's multiple people yeah multiple the same people thing. saying the same thing it's like okay that makes sense it's like it's not just like a you know if people are saying oh this bit didn't really really make sense and it's not just one person saying it it's like that has some validity to it yeah. like the more the people that are agreeing to it it's like okay yeah that is yeah helpful and i think that the editing process came down to like when we when we butt heads you know it'd be over like that's two frames too long or too short. Like that, that is a change here. Like there's really subtle things. And we had people that we'd send our cuts to, right? And we'd be like, what one's better, this one or this one? And people would watch and go, they're exactly the same. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like no one could tell the difference. But like, that, yeah, we get really nitpicky towards the end of, yeah. yeah. A little too nitpicky. Stop you were. Stop picking nits. Stop picking them nits. With horror and pacing, though, I get it. Two yeah. frames could make all the difference. Or, yes. like, showing an insert when you might be focusing on a character could yeah. make all the so difference. Yeah, I was pushing for that subtlety. Michael was, uh, he's just... Wait. Yeah. I don't think, guys, I don't think that was what was happening. <laughs> I want to go back to what you said now at the very beginning of the conversation. The idea of you both making a cut of this film and then also your editor as well. What would you say is the maybe the biggest difference and also the biggest similarity between all three versions of the film? I think that like like w there was times on set where we'd had two days to get a location wrapped, right? And we can't go back there. You can't go back. Everything you get is what's there forever. So we do the first day, like shoot it, and then go home and stay up all night editing it because we know the assembly uh, editor wouldn't like edit the way that we were thinking it. So we stay up all night and then go back to set with no sleep the second day to finish the, the shoot. So And then every time in between setups and things and, and on weekends and stuff, we'd just be editing and editing. So by the time... We had an, the ed, the we went to the editors and we're like, well, we've got a cut of the film too if you want to see it, you know. We and we went through scene by scene and um, compared cuts and what one tells the story best and overall and things like that. And I think the editor Jeff Lamb, who's amazing as well, he had ins and scenes and and like uh, perspectives that we never would have thought of. So it was awesome working with him. And I feel bad for him because I think we I think with the post we also you know, uh, maybe annoyingly involved, you know, we just wanted to be, you know, we had such strong opinions, um, but also like letting them work as well was like a, uh, is it, it was interesting, but like awesome, fun. Not annoyingly involved, highly collaborative. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I'm always here to put positive spins on everything. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question from Roxanne. Can you talk a bit about constructing your horror sequences from prep to production? Do you want to talk about it broadly, or I can throw a specific one that I think is safe to talk about? Oh, yeah, point. go for it, yeah. The oneer. Oh, the oneer. yeah. The so opening oneer is incredible. The, the opening oneer. Yeah, so it was always about... um. Like that one is like we found the location, we knew the beats that needed to happen, and then it was about going there with the cinematographer and then like plotting through it and, and figuring it out. And it was all about pre visualizing it to make sure you know exactly what was going to happen. So we did so much um, scene construction in pre where we're just like filming, sh shot listing, and, shot and, listing and storyboarding, and then shooting just shots, you know, and showing like we wanted the things like with the opening one to be revealing things around every corner kind of thing. Um, and like working with the, the DOP and, and stuff on that to, to make that possible. And then him giving like us all collaborating, coming up with these shots. It makes it easier when you get to set um, to have like we want every scene to have purpose and shot to have purpose and to not feel scattered but to have like a strong sense of direction and vision so it was like it was important for us to to really to do that in in pre -play. there was like even like at, during the second possession scene we had every single character there and it was all about blocking everybody and that became a big thing where i was like in in um pre-production like getting everyone there and then figuring out the blocking of all these characters and like how we could have them well, of course you yeah. do it. You do it with like when it was just like the heads of department. Like we do it like in pre pre, and then when the car the actors come, then we do it again, and like, it changes because like there's a pin. Like they, they, people have suggestions with shot awesome and stuff. Like oh, I'd be more like this. So you kind of incorporate all that, and then when you go to the set as well, like the location can be different to how you were imagining it, so it changes again. So it's just adapting and yeah, yeah. But like, getting well, but hyper specific with the possession stuff now. But in addition to just figuring out your visual language for capturing that, what about directing your actors? like physically too because like there there's certain expressions they need to have like you have the head jerk back thing what was it like figuring out the right way for a possession to physically affect one of your characters well yeah like we wanted the camera to feel a bit like an astral projection and be really floaty you know compared to the other sequences in the film so that there was like a uh, this one shot that like sort of comes down and like reveals the audience and stays the character so it's just about like um with the actor like working with them to like be in sync with the camera movements and stuff like that so it was yeah always keeping the cinematography uh, and that's another testament to the actors as well like like say sophie in, in possessions to be able to perform while being so cam you know uh, aware of where things are and and playing up to that uh while also uh, putting on amazing performances like whew, something uh, but even like yeah. sophie had said like like my, she was so far into that first possession that she like sort of lost her mind a little bit and like everything that she possessed was, for about a week I think. <laughs> I feel like it's it's like a little bit of a sin that I've talked about the cast and I've yet to bring up Miranda Otto. Hey, the other yeah. the other cool thing, in addition to just her being Miranda Otto, is the fact that you wind up making that character like feel like the quintessential mom, but also have her own unique personality that really stands out amongst this group of kids that you're supposed to fall hard for. So what was it like, you know, finding that right balance between having her fill the mom role, but also making her feel like an interesting person as well, because exceptionally well done in that department. Yeah, so she's like inspired by so many of the moms that we wish we had, you know, like, um, like a... In, in, in the film, like, that family is sort of Mia's escape. And she goes there as a second family because she's running away from her own family. And, like, uh, yeah, just inspired by, like, teachers that I know or, like, yeah, friends' mums that I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wish she was my mom. Like, we wanted her, to, like, to be this cool mum that wasn't, like, this, yeah, typical naggy person or anything like that. She was just like, a really exciting, funny like, person. And, and aware. Like, she yeah. knows that they're teenagers and she's aware. Maybe not right all the time but she knows that they're up to no good and I, I, I think that we were really nervous when with Miranda Otto it's like when you're on set also it's like fuck who are we to direct Miranda Otto you know but she was so open and collaborative and warm like she wanted to collaborate and I think that's whatever actor we work with actors we work with in the future we want to be able to do that to for them to be because you hear stories about actors where someone's like can we do another take and the actor that's you know, it's like, we got it. And then, like, it's like, oh, you don't get to, you know, collaborate or change things, you know. It's yeah. good to have people that want to work with you. And she was so, it was like, it was like when, when I first met her, I was so nervous. But then after I spoke to her, I was like, oh, she feels like a fun auntie, you know. And she was just like, yeah, she was the best in, in it, like, the whole process. She was awesome. And, like, having her allowed us to get the cast members that weren't as known. And it made the um the finances and, and the people that were funding the film to be a bit more comfortable with um, letting us have free reign of casting.
All right, I'm going to squeeze in another one from here. Carlia. Uh, from Adelaide. From Adelaide. What did she say after that? Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Oi, oi, oi. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, what was the number of shooting days and what was your biggest challenge on set? Uh, 26 shooting days and the biggest challenge on set was shooting the film in 26 shooting days. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was like so tight and there was days that we were shooting nine pages of the film in one day. And it was like, oh, we're going. there was like one day that was three locations, nine pages of like dialogue. And it was like, yeah, really difficult to like, yeah, it was just so run and gun at, at some points. But um, so an energy like, and it's also like, there's some scenes that, that leans into that when you're under the gun, like, and it's like, you've got to get it done by this time. It's like, and it's, if it's a scene with energy, you can really lean into that and go crazy. Like there's some, some days where we went completely rogue and we had two cameras and like, let's, let's go, let's move, let's. Do and we an amazing like scene came out of it, but it was like a there's a montage scene in the film which was like shot in two hours and had like such two hours okay a bit longer than that wasn't it two hours ten minutes <laughs> yeah like we had scenes like we had to really go for it and um yeah like it was it was yeah like this this like I said it was a tough shoot it was like a a quick shoot it was supposed to be originally eight weeks then it went to seven then it went to six then it went to five I'm like okay <laughs> and then they said four we're like mm, yeah maybe five will you know so we had but there was a day when the, the project guarantor came on set and they is come on what a project guarantor is a project guarantor is like on set to make sure that everything goes on time and he was just on set sitting in the corner and we were very scared of him because he could fire us if he wanted to but yeah, so he was this like scary presence on set that kept us on time. Not an AD? No, this was the project guarantor. No, it's like a uh, yeah, a, a bond. I think it's called bonding. Person. Like oh, making oh, sure oh. that the film's delivered. Yeah, on make budget sure that and, they, and that's okay. their job to like do that. And I think that maybe our way on set is like different. So when they came, like the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. They were awesome. But he was actually only there to visit the set. But when was he was great. on set, we're like, is he here to fire us? Like it was very spooky. A little bit of a random question that might not have a specific answer, but you just brought up uh, energy on set, and you two have a very specific energy. And seeing you with your ensemble too, it's just like, like you have an infectious energy that makes me wonder, like, how do you all like get any work done on set? But also, how do you keep that energy level up so high throughout? I, I think we're just so excited by uh, the idea of making a movie. Like we could do it all day, every day, like. It was so over. So it was never like, yeah, yeah like we, we just already always naturally have an energy and then that, that we're making a movie as well. It's like an extra energy. The the thing is not keeping it up. It's like peeling it back and like, because there's certain scenes in there that are, Diff, uh, you're dealing with difficult subject matter and they're tough scenes and stuff. It's like, we can't be like, you know, like during those scenes. It's like ch choosing the moments to, to peel back. But also the, there are like, you know, half the film is quite tough. And I think that, um, but you don't want that to be the energy when you come on set as well. You don't want it to be dreary coming to set. You don't want everyone to be like, oh, the crew and that to like not want to be there because it's so like like depressing. Like you want it to be a place that's like warm and inviting. But yeah, it was like picking the certain scenes and the characters where like, oh, they've got this scene to do today. So it's about like isolating them a little bit. Like that Joe had like a really tough scene, the kid actor. And so like he spent the day with no one talking to him. So he was able to have the space to get into character and be away from yeah, our like rules. Yeah, because we're very ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> Write that up, please. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I'm really curious. What does that look like? Um, we have two minutes. Does anyone in the room? I think some of these questions are coming from you guys in the room, but does anyone physically here who wants to? Yeah, I saw it. Right in front here. I guess so, yeah. There are mics there. Plump, 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 plump. Minute 30. <laughs> Hello. My Next question. Wiley. <laughs> um, I'm an inspiring music supervisor. It's the thing that's really important to me in movies. Um, and I noticed that you guys have one on yours. And as YouTubers, I'm, you have to go through all those royalties and those music and stuff. So having that option to have a music supervisor, did you guys have certain songs in mind for your movie? Or were they collaborative? with you guys to figure out what songs you wanted in your movie. Yeah, there was a bunch of songs that we knew that we wanted. And then there were some sequences where we were able to send out to our music supervisor songs where like, oh, something like this with this vibe. And then he was able to go away and then come back with like 10 suggestions of stuff that he knew that we could get for quite cheap. So like the opening song of the film 
was different from what we initially wanted, but he presented it to us and it was like, oh, and we fell in love with it. So yeah, and yeah. I think he helped with like there were some bits that were like difficult to gain the rights to. There was some like a some, like a ringtone we had that had multiple owners in different countries and things like that. He was able to mediate that and and get the rights to it. He was also great with like um yeah like getting things that were like we thought were impossible. Like we got a Sia song in there, Chandelier. It's like that would never get that, but he was able to get that for us, and it, it, it helped. Like he always had awesome suggestions, um, and uh, yeah, we loved like, working with him and that. So if you're music supervisor, that's that's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so supervisor. important. Music and sound is so fucking important in a movie. Yeah, I think we had another one in the back there. Yeah, if you both of you, why don't come up to the mic and we'll end with the two of you. Hey guys, um, uh, what do you think is the biggest benefit of working as a directorial duo versus a solo director? Yeah, I think we kind of have a cheat code, like with like brothers filmmakers or duo filmmakers, because there's so much responsibility being able to like um, l share out the load a little bit, and also having someone that has the exact same, like Danny and I have the exact same overall vision. And then even if people aren't seeing it, it's like we know what it, what it is, even if no one else does. So it's like, man, are we going crazy? It's like, oh, maybe we're both just crazy together. But it's it's awesome to have that kind of crux to lean on, you know. And we were able to in post production be able to like, like Danny would do more with the VFX stuff. I do more of the music and the sound and like working with the, with the people on that. So it was like, it was awesome to kind of share the responsibility a bit. Mm -hmm. And then I think on set, Danny was the main like voice on set to more talk important. to. So, important. okay. Yep. Important. <laughs> so like, I think that, so we don't have like conflicting ideas. Like da I say something to him, uh, to an actor and then I walk off and then Danny goes, Hey, now do this. And then the actor's like, but he just said to do something completely different. It was all about listening to the important director. <laughs> this is the last film we're doing together. <laughs> Please. Uh, last one. Pressure's on. Take us home with a good one. So uh, now that you guys made the movie of the summer, what comes next? Yes. The movie of next summer. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we've been offered so much stuff. We've been lucky enough to get into all these rooms. Um, we're just going to go back to Australia and then I put everything on the table and decide. But like, I think we're very excited for... We're working on two spec scripts, so two more original films. One's a horror, one's an action. And so I think one of those will probably be... And then also the sequel would be great as well. Like A24 are excited, we're excited for it. It's like we have so many ideas, uh, but there's ones that are further along. It's like what one makes sense for next? Because they say that the second film is in some ways more important than the first one. So the first one gets you there, like gets you to the dance, and then the second one is like proving you should stay and be... You here. can dance. Yes. <laughs> and Danny cannot dance. <laughs> Chris Solosio says hi. Oh, oh, is that so this is why Chris. Chris. <laughs> 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 He's one of the actor's friends there. He, uh, yeah. he appears Legend. in random places. Like, I did not know he was here. <laughs> A plus <laughs> question to close us out with right now. And I'll just remind everybody in the audience that the movie does come out in theaters this summer, July 28th. And then don't forget the AFS Cinema buzz screening is tonight at 8 p.m. So you could see it for the first time. If you haven't seen it, you could see it again. Again, repeat viewings with this movie are a must. Danny Michael, congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much for coming, guys. Thank Thanks you. so much. Awesome.